This is the Annex, a sociology podcast. I'm Joseph Cohen from Queens College in the City University of New York. In today's pre-recorded episode, Daniel Morrison from Abilene Christian University sits down with Omar Lazardo from UCLA and Seth Aberton from UBC to discuss classical sociology and their new book of classical sociological theory. Well, Seth and Omar, so good to have you on. Seth, like I said earlier, this is a return visit for you, but Omar, glad to have you, and thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah thanks for the invite. All right. Well, the first voice you heard there was Seth, and the second was was Omar. So unlike some other things that most other things that I do on the podcast, I did not read all the handbook of classical <laughs> sociological theory. There are lots of great and very interesting selections in there. I was going to give you an exam afterwards, so I guess yeah. that's out of the question. Yeah, totally not prepared for that. <laughs> it's, 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 it's only like 500 pages. Come on. <laughs> yeah, it's only 500 pages. But I actually, you know, I did read a few selections and looked at several more. And these are digestible. I mean, they're not, each chapter is not super, super long. So I think for someone who is interested in, you know, some of the the core issues that you that the book lays out, it's a thing that you can dip into, and you don't have to feel bad about not reading all 500 pages. But you seem to have developed this handbook to challenge how many of us think about classical theory and its purpose in the discipline. So let's start first with how does your text define classical theory in maybe a way that's atypical for the discipline? Well. I don't know if Omar and I ever had an actual conversation about the definition. I can tell you a little bit of the background. He and I had been working on a paper and we'd just been generally talking about how we teach theory at the grad and undergraduate level, more generally what the discipline sees as classical theory. And, you know, there's sort of this backwards gazing sort of, we need to learn all the classics, read them word for word master them and then we must choose our you know as my old uh, mentor john turner would say our our patron saint of you know classical theory and it just it sort of it doesn't work in the realm of science that's just not how science operates when they when we think about theory we sort of lose these classical people's names or we lose like reading you know very few people read darwin's origin of the species from front to back or see it or like critique it or draw principles from it any more than they've already done into an intro textbook. And so we talked about how could we take a handbook, which is generally like a big review and toss away the review idea and ask experts in different sort of areas of classical theorizing to reflect upon the classics, but to really kind of think about it more contemporary, right? So like if you're teaching a classical theory class, how could you teach it more like a contemporary theory class drawing from these these guys and some of these women at, without having to redo it all every single time? Yeah, and I mean, I think that, you know, the one thing that we wanted to do is really change people's idea about what classicality, if that's a word, means. Mm-hmm. In other words, we wanted to essentially redraw the boundary of classical theory so that, A, you moved away from, you know, what Seth was talking about, which I tend to think of it in terms of the humanistic conception of class, classicality, what's something mean classical, which tends to focus people, classical authors or texts, classical texts. So that's kind of like, you know, the tradition that comes out of English. And I think that, that we wanted to kind of come up with a version of classical that made sense for sociology in particular by really focusing on like themes or sites that those are something is classical because it is something that is important and people return to it, right? And I think that that's that, that that's what we wanted to you know ultimately kind of kind of signal that when putting the the book together, organized around that kind of thematic that that we were pointing like these are the important things, right? Rather than you know these are the big books or the big authors. With with the one exception that we made very consciously was the chapter on W.E. Du Bois, who does focus on a classical author, mostly because there we also wanted to signal that this was obviously a neglected uh, uh, author that deserves to be in the classical canon. But even that chapter really focuses on big themes like racism, Mm -hmm. colonialism, et cetera. So so we kind of, even for that chapter, we kind of try to uh, signal to the authors that we wanted the big thematics, not just the big person. Yeah. So what I'm hearing you, you say is, you know, kind of de-emphasizing 
reading maybe a bunch of the writings of, you know, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, you know, some folks put Zimmel in there, some folks put Du Bois in there, some folks put any, any one or two of a number of women in there, but rather focusing on the enduring kind of problematics and concepts that are, you know, still central to how sociologists practice today. You know, I think you're, you're right to say it would be very weird if biologists today who are like Minch scientists or trained to be Minch scientists read Origin of the Species mm -hmm. all the way through, or physicists who are working on, you know, whatever physicists work on, <laughs> you know, are reading, are reading Newton, you know, cover to cover. We have a couple of colleges for that kind of thing, like St. John's, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. is, and I guess maybe Scheimer, are, you know, colleges that are super unusual mm -hmm. because that's what, that's what they do. But Seth, your focus on and the the way you articulated you know, sociology as a scientific discipline, very different than this sort of focusing on the canon and the kind of canon wars that uh, people often uh, fight over who should be in and, yeah. and exactly where. The, the bigger issue that we're facing is there's 250 some odd years one could call theory and you could go back to Ibn Khaldun in you know the medieval islamic period you could go to plato and the republic i mean there's social theory and the question is is are we teaching theory and i i just wonder whether classical theory has so many things it has to do the history of sociology the teaching of the trinity of marx weber durkheim you know the inclusion of du bois and like the marginalized scholars like the critical school that had like the critique of these guys the you know, let's read Durkheim and then, you know, critique him for using terrible language that, you know, nowadays would be completely off base, right? But at his time was just the way that people talked as bad as it was. And then these these students, if they have to take contemporary theory as well in their undergraduate careers, they move on to, un to the to undergraduate and then, they're, you know, we're back to these biographies and there's like a disconnect between this sort of history and then there's this mid-century piece, right? Du Bois, for instance, goes all the way through to the mid-century of the 20th century. You have Parsons, who doesn't fit in classical or contemporary. Merton, who doesn't really fit in classical or contemporary. All these other folks that didn't really, fi really fit that well. Bloomer. And so you don't know what the heck to do, right? So people just end up cherry-picking whatever they like the most. And... You know, the way I think about it is like Durkheim's Elementary Forms of Religious Life is really fascinating and it is a good read in certain places, but who cares whether his data were right or wrong? Like he has a really great idea. And then you can see in Edward Lawler's work and uh, Randall Collins' work and so many contempt and even in neuroscience, you can see that he was right, basically, about the, the basics of how ritual solidarity generates, you know, emotions, collective arousal, and this collect that collective arousal creates collective identities, and then people feel strong affinity towards each other. You know, I mean, that's the basic idea. Who needs to read 480 pages to get that idea? Right? I mean, that's, but I you know, suffered, Seth. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, that's the answer to everything as a college professor, right? I suffered, so therefore you shall, right? No, I, yeah, I was just reading a Stefan and Seems article in Teaching Sociology about theory maps. And their whole point is use a visual aid to scaffold and to bring students in and help them decode these like really complex texts that we don't typically ask students to do. You know, you put Durkheim in front of, you know, a 19 year old, most, not, most 19 year olds, and they say, what, what is this? You know, and they're, they're reading line by line, sentence by sentence and, or marks for that matter. And, and even, you know, even graduate students, who say, I don't, what is this? You know, mm -hmm. I, I have no, I have no roadmap for this. Right. So in any, in any case, I mean, we've already kind of bridged this, but you know, so one problem you've articulated with teaching classical theory is kind of the boundary problem. So who's in and who's out in terms of time periods, but also teaching classical theory as if it's a story of individual scholars in their own like time and, and place. Say more about that part of the problem. Well, I mean, I think that the, so the, yeah, so I think that we, we wanted to kind of resolve that problem. It's actually the problem of choice. In, the, in other words, don't begin by choosing authors, begin by choosing what you think are the classical problems or themes, and then let the authors fall as they may. Right? You know, theoretically, everybody who has kind of contributed to kind of thinking about some fundamental aspect of social life, you know, from schools to cognition to the state, 
should be a classical author. So, for instance, you know, I think the state is a great example. You know, Max Weber is such a dominant figure. It's mostly because like he, you know, in that in that realm. So that that's an easy one for you. If you choose to state, you kind of have to choose Weber because he's so central in terms of providing basic definitions, etc. But he's not the only one, right? So, so I feel like the the idea of like you don't choose Weber because of some uh, kind of reflex that he's a part of a trinity is mostly because you pick some really important aspects of your life and Max Weber happened to have mm-hmm. produced some fundamental contribution that people still draw upon today because that's the other thing. It's not just somebody coming up with a contribution because there's a lot of theories of the states that are now dead and forgotten because they're not relevant to the contemporary conversation, right? So I think like that, that idea is the author has to have contributed to something, to understanding something that where classicality lies in the importance of the thing. And of course, there has to be a living tradition of thinking, not not just not just a pure kind of a historical approach. Yeah, and we we actually we were doing some other project at the time, and we were digging into old books from the '60s and '50s and '40s, and basically there weren't <laughs> theory textbooks; there were just books, right? And so, like these books, we, we tried to organize some of the topics along those lines. So, you know, one section is called spheres of social life. And this is kind of speaks to what Omar was talking about with the state, right? I, I would call it polity. It's just the general sort of political system itself. But we study economics. We study the economy. We study religion, or we used to study religion much more heavily. We used to study kinship. That's not really something sociologists do. They mostly study family now. But law used to be a much bigger sort of central space. Medicine. These are big spheres that the theorists were like really interested in. Not all of them. But you know, Weber, for instance, covered a whole bunch. Durkheim was, of course, interested in kinship, the economy, religion. Marx was interested in the economy and the state. And, you know, and you get into the minor theorists, too, and they all have kind of like a couple of things that they really liked a lot. And then if you think about that and you're teaching a course, instead of saying, OK, we're going to learn Weber's typology of action, Weber's typology of authority. Now, tell me why there's four types of action and three types of authority. You know what I mean? Like, or do we just say sociologists were studying the state. Why were they studying the state? What was really important about it? What changed in the 19th century that mattered? What, how does colonialism operate, right? Where there is a state that's imposing stateness on a group of people, right? How does all, that's what seems so much more fascinating. And that's the thread that then carries into contemporary sociology. People don't write typologies of action and stuff like that that often anymore. They don't write like a big book like that anymore, at the very least. But they study the state. There's political sociologists, right? And there's political economists and there's economic sociologists, there's world systems people, and they all study the same kind of dynamics, right? So I just want to give people a sense of how this handbook is organized. So it's it's organized in several sections. So the, the first section is about overarching questions, kind of central uh, problematics that the discipline and, and classical theory tackles. The second is on central dynamics, things like differentiation, power, regulation, social order, relational sociology, theories of power. Then spheres of social life, as you're just you're saying, Seth. After that, a section on new social forms, collective behavior, social movements, those those sorts of civil society, those sorts of things. Then interactions, symbols, and the psyche. And then identifying conceptual threads is the the last last section. Maybe tell us about you know how you came up with that organization strategy and why those you know five or six sections. Wow, that's a tough question I have, to remember. I have a vague memory. <laughs> no, I know I know we discussed so the spheres of social life is something that's dear to me. I, I write a lot of mm-hmm. stuff in institutions, and so I've always mm-hmm. kind of thought that way. The, the overarching questions, I think, was just a easy one to, that was low-hanging fruit, right? I mean, itself was a big problem in American sociology. Evolution was a huge theme in social sciences. Modernity is obviously always looming in the background. And theory and methods in classical theory are just so much different than we treat theory and methods today. Do you remember Omar Moore? I mean, we definitely... One thing we wanted to do, I, I will say about the psyche, the chat, the section on psyche, we wanted to bring back the Freudian sort of stuff that has completely disappeared. And, you know, even before Parsons, people were talking about consciousness and unconsciousness. And so that's one of my favorite chapters is bringing that kind of sort of psychological, phenomenological stuff back into the, to the conversation. 
I mean, yeah. I personally am so interested in that. I know Lynn Chancer is one of the authors mm -hmm. and there was an ASA pre-conference a couple years ago in New York mm -hmm. on the psychosocial. Mm -hmm. And you have to say that in, in a particular way because it means a particular kind of mm -hmm. kind of thing. But, you know, I one of my favorite podcasts, uh, should I be plugging other podcasts? One of my favorite <laughs> podcasts is... Um, Know your enemy, and they they have several episodes on like psychoanalysis and and political life, and so it's it's a thing that I've been more curious about. Um, and as an interactionist, I'm really interested in mm -hmm. shirts and and those things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, that that's also kind of shows that, you know, we were doing two kind of two things with putting together both the particular chapters and the and the and the sections. I mean, for some things from some chapters, you know, we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. We kind of knew this is important. This is a classical thing, et cetera. For other ones, I think the chapter on on that kind of Freudian understanding of consciousness and unconsciousness, we, we wanted to performatively, you know, say <laughs> this is important. <laughs> Pay attention to it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, reclaim it because obviously something like like Freud, you know, had a heyday in the 1950s, 1960s, and essentially kind of declines and disappears out of out of consciousness, pun intended. So we wanted to say, like, kind of bring back the classical spotlight. You know, if you think about classicality as being something like, you know, saying like this is important, look at it, teach it. So mm -hmm. we, we did, we definitely did that with that chapter. I think the other one that had the same kind of point was the last chapter on cognition, and that Stephen Turner wrote. And he wrote it exactly like that. It's like, well, if you go back to like, you know, Spencer and Comta, it's like these people are, you know, dealing with the cognitive science of their time. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that completely disappears for you know, a variety of historical reasons. So we wanted to say, hey, this is important. You know, pay attention to it again. It's a classical theme. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the other sections, you know, I mean, we were, we were thinking, I mean, the central dynamics, I think, is obvious. Power is core and the state is core political sort of economy is core to the classics zimmel is was at probably not as important in the mid-century but has increasingly become really really important to the discipline and so we had to figure out a way to bring that sort of network relational sort of homens kind of stuff to, to life and then we got we were really i mean i asked we asked patricia hill collins to write a chapter we didn't really know exactly what she would do when she proposed this you know, it was really such a fascinating and provocative idea that, okay, so when we talked about stratification in the classics, generally speaking, it's class, right? I mean, that's really what the focus is, class and status. And now, right, there's been this sort of pendulum towards race, gender, sexuality, and class is there, but it's, there's like this sort of weird separation between class and these other categories of intersectionality. And, I, and she was really critical of the very sort of field that she helped to like build and it's like and so that you know this was these were neat dynamics that were were pretty obvious i think to us when you look at the classics I'm trying to think of the other ones the the new forms i think is also pretty obvious this you know with modernity came urbanization and this was like a huge piece of the chicago school and the atlanta school Social movements became a big deal. Collective behavior was a separate piece to that. Organizations out of Weber, the sort of civil society area was there. And of course, then the other, which becomes a very prominent piece in like Fanon and like various critical strands of sociology, um, as well as like even more traditional like Goffman folks. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's yeah. kind of, yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead, Omar. No, I was going to say that, that in that section, you know, we kind of uh, paired the the social movements and the crowd uh, chapters in, on purpose because mm -hmm. that's definitely in the case of crowds, you know, with some of the awesome jo job uh, work that Christian Borch has been doing recently. That's definitely a reclamation project, too. It is a social central concern about all the classics. I mean, essentially all of them, you know, Durkheim, Weber, Tarda dealt with that in some way. But it once again, it, it declined precisely because of modern social movement theory defined itself against it as saying like, no, people are not irrational, et cetera. So I feel like that's, you know, that's another one when we wanted to shine the spotlight. It's like, oh, maybe we should kind of revisit it. You know, the study of crowd and collective behavior without the stereotypes uh, that we kind of, you know, kind of accumulated for, for the last 30 years because it was just a fundamental dimension of social life. And of course, you know, we didn't know that January 6th was going to happen when we did that, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think in the end, I think what we were thinking when we thought of the bigger themes and we started to, you know, collect authors who were proposing things that felt like they fit together, 
I think the bigger thing was, okay, if you were teaching a classical theory course and you really were tired of the typical texts and having to assign all the primary sources, you could still assign primary sources using this handbook. And you were tired of like the debate, like using your class as a debate, whether like we've completely got it wrong and it's time to throw all the white dudes out and like just bring everybody else in or whether we should just stuff it full of everybody and spend like a day on this person, a day on that person. We're like, what if you, you know, spent a ter- like half the term talking about like the big problems and the big questions and then another half of the term talking about like the conceptual threads, right? The things that were there that kind of disappeared, but then came back, right? I mean, you can still do these intellectual reclamation projects in that case, or if you were teaching, you know, like if you're breaking your class into ideas of like community and then into power and authority and into like the sacred and into the self, you could take some of these pieces from different sections and be like, okay, power, there's the other, there's actual chapter on power, the chapter on regulation, et cetera, et cetera. You could kind of design this and then you still have the, all the citations. So your students can go find these readings if they wanted to. But you're getting fresh ideas, you know, new to spin on it. I hate to ask you this, but I will anyway. You have any, have any favorites in this in this book? <laughs> any favorite chapters you want to highlight? I read the Du Bois chapter. It just reminded me how the breadth of his knowledge and just the number of contributions. I mean, I yeah, someone did a calculation. It was something like the guy wrote an average of like 12 pages per day. I mean, like published an average of like 12 pages per day, which I think is just, you know, nuts. Uh, yeah, obviously like cr- incredibly unprecedented. Mm-hmm. It helps if you're like the editor of Crisis and you've got your own outlet. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I'm a part of a Du Bois like reading group every Monday morning out of UMass and we read stuff from him. We're never going to get to the bottom of the stuff that Du Bois right. has published. Right. And then the unpublished stuff, unbelievable. But anyway, yeah. enough about my love of Du Bois. <laughs> do you, do you want to highlight a couple of chapters for folks? I, I'll, I'll just throw, I mean, I'm very partial to symbolic interactionism in general and micro sociology, even though I do some evolutionary macro stuff. So that whole section, all three chapters in the interaction symbols and psyche, I thought were mm-hmm. fabulous, fabulous yes. chapters, really creative, really interesting chapter on empathy, which we discussed prior to the start of this. I thought, I mean, just what an important idea in the American social psychological pragmatist tradition that somehow disappeared just because of the way we had treated emotions. But I also, on that note, really like Erica Summers Effler's chapter in the very beginning mm-hmm. of the, the book self. She's, she's a lot like us where she's really interested in, she's not interested in boundaries between sciences. And that chapter really kind of pulls at like, I mean, it's provocative. It's saying here's pragmatism, here's phenomenology. I know they don't get along, but we can get, make them get along. And there's some neuroscience in there and a little cognitive science in there just, you know, to kind of like sprinkle that bridge and build it up a bit. But those I thought were really, really, really fabulous chapters. I was really happy how those came out. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, the, and, and another one in that section by Vanina Leshner and a cover mm-hmm. that, that I, mean, I think that that chapter also did something that was our plan, which is also kind of explode, you know, explode the boundary of what classical, what counts as classical, because structuralism mm-hmm. is such a tradition associated with the twentieth century that usually gets put in contempor- as contemporary theory. But for us, you know, now enough time has passed that we know that that tradition of thinking about symbols and semiotics is classical. I mean, it's, you know, Saussure is a classic. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's, it's, there's an, an, like, that has to be a classic, right? Mm-hmm. And connects to mm-hmm. Durkheim. And, you know, so I feel like that, I think that chapter, you know, did kind of perform both in terms of being an awesome chapter that you can assign, you know, you learn a lot from, but also kind of making our point about what, can, what should count as classical today. Yeah. And I would then also throw in, I mean, okay, so I'm very partial to the really sort of classical social science of kinship. Mm-hmm. I love kinship and <laughs> it is completely non-existent in sociology probably for the last 30 years. And I think Mariansky's chapter probably is far more review than most of the chapters, but it is mm-hmm. really does a service if for people who are interested in family and interested in the more broad institution of kinship like it does a really cool job and i also love the religion chapter and mm-hmm. the, the shift to kind of the phenomenology of religion like thinking about it experientially mm-hmm. and like thinking about the classics not in the pure structural sense that they often treat it but more in that Durkheimian way of like being immersed in and assembled and plunging themselves in the waters of the collective you know and kind of taking that real seriously and then 
they really chart that out into contemporary sociology, which again, I think is a great exemplar of like what we wanted from authors to do. And that religion chapter, that's Daniel Winchester, right? Yep. yep. Yeah. Um, Michal Pages and mm-hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. I'm glad I remembered that correctly. There's nothing worse than getting someone's <laughs> name. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, but there's so many good ones. Like, I mean, yes. ben, ben Berryman wrote a great chapter on art, which yes. is yeah. it is becoming more and more interest. People are more and more interested in it in sociology, but it was like always mm-hmm. kind of there. You know, at least there were threads there. And then the collective behavior chapter, like this is becoming more and more interesting to sociologists again. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Christian Borch is so great at this and, and just so important to like remember that this was a thing and we probably should revisit mm-hmm. it. Yeah, and art, art and the aesthetic is something that we knew we wanted in, you know, mm-hmm. because once again, it's one of those things that doesn't, you know, get Get, and it's not the first thing that you, it's not the first kind of site that you think of as classicality. You see the state, you know, polity, religion, etc. But I think art and aesthetics is such an important thing. I think was that was a really nice way of kind of both kind of trying to anoint that as a classical theme, but also connect with more recent mm-hmm. things. You know, because the sociological study of art itself is relatively contemporary phenomenon. But I think what we wanted to say is well, it also connects to this kind of classical. Mm-hmm. classical things that even kind of, you know, go all the way even before, you know, the institutionalization of sociology as a science. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, as someone who is, uh, I, don't know, I guess I'm mid-career now. I don't feel old. <laughs> what, what, what does that start exactly? <laughs> uh, I think the, the moment you earn tenure, I think, is the yeah, mid-career that, that, and that, moment. Yeah. And hopefully it lasts until you're like 60, right? <laughs> then, yeah, well, but... but but full professor before then, though, Omar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Ideally. I'm curious about, you know, how how you decided to undertake this project and what you, what you learned. Maybe there are folks out there who want to, are thinking about proposing a handbook or an edited volume, you know, bringing people together around a, a topic. Maybe there's a, I mean, uh, maybe there's another uh, version of a, a similar project on a different different set of issues how did you how did you structure your your process in in doing this and what did you learn about putting together a text like this oh man well seth had experience with a previous one i think yeah Yeah. i had edited the contemporary theory handbook and i knew what i didn't want to do and i I learned a lot of lessons and i also knew what i i did want to do i mean i was pretty young and fresh out of grad school to some degree when i did the contemporary one and so i omar and i had really started to talk a lot more and we started to we were working on a paper at the time and i just pitched the idea because we had talked a lot about classical theory and some of the stresses that we faced or some of the things that we didn't like and so we we agreed that we weren't going to do a review type of text as I noted before. And so what we structured this email, we wrote an email and we, I mean, we picked a list of people, obviously we, we already had ideas for chapters and we were like, well, who would be perfect for writing a chapter on this and that. And then we just, you know, we cold called people through this email and we're basically like, we want you to write this and this isn't going to be a review chapter. We want you to do something original and creative. And I know that that takes time and effort, and, but what we're hoping is to produce something that's more enduring than just a reference text that, you know, a lot of these end up becoming dusty shelved texts that uh, grad students have to, used to have to pay for. Now I guess they're free through libraries. And, you know, so that we, we just kind of went with that. And when people would respond, some people were like, really, oh my God, this is a great idea. I have a hundred ideas. And then we would kind of give them mm-hmm. feedback on their ideas. Some people would kind of like go the stodgy route of like, well, okay, I will do it like this, you know, when they would give you this outline <laughs> of like exactly what you'd expect in a review text. And so we kind of push back gently and try and mold it a little bit. And, you know, then there are some people who are just not interested in it or didn't see the value in it. And, you know, we would move on to, down, down the list. And I, mean, I, I remember, I remember we had pretty good success, right? Yeah, we, we got mo- we, we got most of the people that we wanted on the first. Yeah. Like we had a, a we had a list of like you know first choice, second choice, third mm-hmm. choice. We yeah. almost never got to the third choice. Most mm-hmm. of the time, we got our first yeah. choice. And I mean, the reality of it is, is like we were we were offering somebody a, a publication that was like super creative in a rare in a rare moment of like being able to do whatever you want, right? They, mm-hmm. You know, both for for the junior scholars, this was a, a, a leap of faith for them, obviously. 
for the senior scholars like Patricia O'Connell is like immediately, I know exactly what I want to write. This is great. Yes. I've been wanting to write this, but I didn't know where to put it, you know? Yeah. And so this is perfect. And so, uh, and of course, she's, she was the one that we wanted. Yeah, we so, wanted, yeah that was, was nice. First, <laughs> exactly. Good, yeah. First choice, PHC. Yeah, yeah. You're right. on my list, I think, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, we, were, we, were, we were excited when you said yes. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I mean, that was really fun. And I mean, anytime you edit anything, this is the third thing I've ever edited, and it's like herding cats. You know, you have to stay super organized, which is what we did, and we just kept sending reminders and stuff, and we really didn't have. I mean, we had a couple of people who dragged a little bit, right? But for the most part, I think people were really on time and punctual about turning their things in. It's, it's that's that's the hardest part is just keeping tabs mm-hmm. of everybody and making sure everybody's like doing their things, and then setting time aside when a bunch of papers come in, a bunch of chapters come in for actually editing them and giving feedback. Yeah, I mean, I think that even if I were to kind of give advice to somebody that wants to do something like this, I think you know, you should, you should have kind of like, a, you, have to have, you should have a strong vision of what you want to do and not just have a collection. Of, I mean, it's pretty easy to put together a collection of papers on the same subject mm-hmm. that, that is just a collection. But I think that if you, that, that if you have a big picture vision, then it's easier because essentially then you're kind of just more fitting pieces into a larger puzzle than just collecting like a serially, you know, a, a disorganized set of, set of things. Because mm-hmm. once again, it makes it easier in terms of identifying people and, you know, and the other thing, you know, that, that I would recommend is that oh, you, you should always search for balance. I think that this collection ended up being really good because we wanted balance across various dimensions. We wanted junior and more established scholars. We obviously wanted gender balance, you know, and I think that that created a really nice mixture of, of kind of when people, of, of approaches, but also of kind of the kind of takes on, on, on certain classical themes that that's, I think read as fresher than, than otherwise. Yeah, I would say that balance piece is really important to actually creating something original and creative if that's the goal, right? Like if you really do want to just do a review, you need to get that, the super duper experts because that's they're going to get the most hits and the most downloads. But if you want something like classical theory, if you want to change it, you have to have a balance of younger people who are already rethinking it, who already aren't like set in their ways, who haven't written like 75 uh, essays <laughs> on like Durkheim before, you know what I mean? Like who already have their like spiel all set. And then right. you do need those senior people because some of them are thinking like, hey, I've been doing this a long time and I'm bored with it. Like, what could I, how, how can I rethink this? Or I've already begun rethinking. I mean, I've only been teaching undergraduate theory for 11 years and I, more than that, I guess since when I was a grad student for like maybe 15 years and I'm bored with it. I've been changing it for years because it's, if you do it the same way, it really is probably the most dull rote exercise besides maybe introductory sociology. Mm-hmm. Well, as I said, I teach the social theory class here. And at the end of every semester, I think I'm going to throw out this entire syllabus and <laughs> start over. And not necessarily because I'm bored with the readings, but because I think you're right that, you know, the process of going through them can become stale and stale and rote. And mm-hmm. so even though for almost all of my students, you know, this is their first encounter with mm-hmm pretty much almost all of right. these these authors, except for the ones who are in intro, who read some Marx and some Du Bois and mm-hmm. some, other, some other folks who I really care about in the intro course. The thing that you, you made me think of, though, is you know the difference between someone who is using some of these classical ideas in their own contemporary and their own work today versus someone who has written a bunch of, a bunch of exegesis on you know, a, a, classical, a classical figure. Yeah, I think Omar referred to that as the humanistic approach. And mm-hmm. and look, there's a place in the field for that. I mean, there's a journal, the classical journal of sociology. I mean, there's there's something to that. But the, as I noted, the question is, is, is that a class on the history of sociology or like the history of social ideas or social knowledge or a class on theory, right? And the, the, if our goal is to produce students who at the undergraduate level are able to do a capstone thesis or can become marketable in a way that they know how to do some kind of research and market themselves as able to do that or to critically think about things or for grad students to actually use this in their research, then we need to be teaching it like theory. Like we need, I mean, I know most people would, would not buy my ideas about, we need the principles of, right. And, and I get that that is, sounds like too physics-y or, you know, some like science envy, as, as I think the pejorative term sometimes is. 
But I do think that what are we equipping them with if all we're doing is like, you know, okay, we just read half of Capital. Now let me tell you why it's wrong. <laughs> you know, like, like, let me tell you what's wrong with it. Okay, so why did we do that exercise? You know, what was the point of, of, of reading all of that? You know, besides, as you said, because I had to do it. Well, I was only doing that. No, I know. I had great theory experiences <laughs> at Virginia and Vanderbilt. But I hear what you're saying in terms of like antiquarian interest or, you know, parsing the, you know, particular tense of this or that, you know, phrase or, you know, the nuances of, of a term, mm -hmm. you know, and the, <laughs> the development of the thought of a particular, you know, idea in a person's thought or something like that versus homing in on the on the most important concepts and debates for, mm -hmm. for use in, mm -hmm. in current, in current scholarship. Yeah. I mean, it is, a, it is a way of establishing kind of like the identity of the discipline too. Like what, it, what is, you know, people always, what is sociology? Well, sociology is the field that really cares about this set of questions and concepts, right? And not necessarily the, you know, a long list of authors, you know, from the beginning in 1850 or something like that. We are the true believers in the religion of the Trinity of Faber, Mark. <laughs> oh my God. Uh, it's, you know, that, that's not going to win us a lot of friends. Yeah, no. And for an instructor, right? So let's say theory is not your area. I mean, most... You can't, it's hard to find a graduate program nowadays where you can specialize in theory anyway, but let's say theory is not your area and you end up teaching that course because you're one of the few sociologists in your department that feels comfortable doing it or wants to do it. What are you supposed to do, right? I mean, are you going to just reproduce the, the canon, right? Are you going to produce, this gets back to just what are we up to? You know, what is the point of the course itself? And I mean, what are we interested in, right? I mean, we're interested in organization, we're interested in stratification and inequality we're interested in like these dynamics that our, our chapters touch on and so why do we need to like do these deep dives right exegists why do, why do we need to get so deep into them like it's the bible and again i know that won't win me many acolytes but like i do feel that we could just we could really know these ideas and move forward and think about what's going on how they inform contemporary sociology and that's a great introductory class to theory and then the, the next class, if there is a second class in the sequence, can be a much more advanced theoretical class that like really delves into core ideas that are happening in the last 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And I think that, it, you know, like you mentioned, the pedagogical challenge of, you know, making students interested in reading the material, right? I think that if you can, if you can facilitate the, the ability to connect what they're reading to things that they are have some experience with in the present mm -hmm. and then that makes a huge difference right an old musty text written in 1895 you, you could do it but it's harder than than it if it's a core problematic that keeps repeating because it's central right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean how many people have assigned weber like a, a section of weber to their students and he goes through one of those laundry lists of historical examples when he's in the <laughs> phase and like how many of our students actually know that and that's that's not to say that they shouldn't know it. They absolutely should know those things, if some of them at the very least. But like, that's not our job to teach them that, right? In that course, there's other courses for that. There's other disciplines that focus on history. There's other, you know, historical sociology is a course that could be taught that could like talk about how people actually do historical sociology. But in the end, you know, we, we're losing them or they're stressed out. And when I think they say that there's too much reading, like sometimes I wonder, Am I over assigning reading vis-a-vis -vis my colleagues or is this reading just so dense and so old and so like antiquated that, you know, I, I am torturing them. And I, I mean, I get it. Like, <laughs> if I was a philosophy professor, right? Philosophy 101, how do you not make them read the primary sources, right? Yeah, no, that, I think that I think that the density is exactly that. It's sometimes not necessarily the number of pages, but it's almost like a, mm -hmm. like a neutron star. It's like how much reading is there per unit of, mm -hmm. you know, reading. And I think that sometimes you know, get you know, slogging through Max Weber can feel like a lot, even if it's the same ten pages that you know yeah. anybody, everybody's assigning. You know, yeah, or reading like Durkheim writing in like a French legalistic style, where he starts the chapter by positing the thesis he plans to destroy. And he actually proves the thesis for a little while. And you're sitting there underlining, you're like, oh my God, you're right. And then he demolishes the thesis. And by the end, you're just like, what just happened? Like, what is his point yeah. here? What's his position? And then he tells you. 
at the very end. Whereas, you know, nowadays in the journal article, you would tell somebody in the abstract, you tell them in the introduction, and then in the conclusion, at least if it was written well, and, and they would know, right? So yeah, I mean, I assign like four pages, you know? Mm-hmm. Right. And they still complain, I'm sure. I, I've been using, for a while, I was using a, a reader by Lewis Kozer, and I, I can't remember his, the other author was like Rosenblum or Rosenberg. Like, it's it's the last time it was published was in the late 80s, and it is organized by big conceptual ideas, and then there's like mm-hmm. 10, it's like a reader, basically. There's like 10 short excerpts from both people we know very well as well as more like i mean for him classical theory like went all the way into the 1940s and 50s and they still complain about that even though it's like two pages it's like two pages on rolls from need and they're still angry about it so i don't, I don't know well i'm sure they're doing their their best we don't let's not go further down the uh students don't read these days um, <laughs> You know, true confession, I, I wasn't always the best student myself in terms of reading everything. Well, I do hope folks will, will look at this text because it, 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 is, it, it helps us think about, you know, alternative pathways to a class that is taught or classes that are taught, you know, basically everywhere at, at all levels of the, you know, graduate, undergraduate, you know, curricula to master's only students often as well. And so, you know, it's it can be more than you know a difficult socialization into the into the profession. Well, I'm I'm curious about you, you've mentioned already the fact that you, the two of you have collaborated on some some things. So maybe could you preview for us? Tell us about your current current work, the things that you're you're doing um, these days. You want me to go first? <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So we we when we first started working together. I had been in, invited to write a paper for Advances in Group Processes, which is a one of those emerald sort of hardbound once a year published journals that's primarily, you know, social psychologists, usually the harder social psychologists, like experimental folks. But uh, there, there's usually some really, really interesting papers in there. And because it, it's peer reviewed, but it's not like centralized in like, S, like social psychology quarterly, there's a little bit like more room for being creative and I saw it as a good opportunity. Omar and I had talked about doing something. I was like, well, I got this invitation, you know, you kind of, this would be a great place to play in a sandbox and, you know, to combine. So I, at the time I'd started to read a lot of affective neuroscience. I was really starting to get into Panksepp and Ledoux and people like that, Damasio. And Omar was of course like interested in a lot of those ideas as well, but like thinking about how to bridge the affective and the cognitive stuff together and to speak about the self. So, so we wrote an article on that and there was a lot of obviously like leftover bits and pieces and a lot of ideas that were kind of hanging around. And like the big one was for me was thinking about motivation, like the sociology of motivation, right? How are people actually motivated to act? And, you know, the, the, the science behind motivation in the last 10 or 15 years is very, very different from what it once was. You know, it's not mm-hmm. pure behaviorism. It's not hedonism like it once was in the mid-century. And it's not really aligned with the way sociologists think of, you know, what motivates us. It's not rooted in these distal forces like goals and values and interests that are not really actually driving our motor behaviors but much more related to the brain and like how the brain operates on, you know, uh, the primate level and the million level. And so I started to talk to Omar about some of these ideas and some of the leftover pieces. And we, so we've been really digging into the ideas of motivation and like where affect fits, not, not the emotions part, not the cultural piece of emotions, but like the, the actual affective responses that we have that are often pre-conscious and sometimes unconscious not in the Freudian sense but in the sense that we're just not aware of them and thinking about how we can not like you know slay sociology but like incorporate this into sociology to mm-hmm. improve how we think about action right what makes us act yeah and, and in many ways it, it's kind of you know it became also ultimately a, a somewhat of a reclamation project of things that kind of used to be central, but kind of dropped out in terms of thinking about how people, you know, are, you know, energized to just, you know, do their stuff. So one thing that we kind of discovered both in the effect, in the effective neuroscience work and the new science of motivation is, you know, like essentially kind of like how for a lot of those disciplines are now kind of centered, you know, in a lot in the idea of reward and value, which 
kind of, you know, value not in the sense of values in the abstract, but value in terms of like, you know, I value this apple or something like that, you know, or this conversation. Yeah. Right? And, and I think that th- those two concepts then for us kind of, with, with, we began to do a lot of kind of that kind of reclamation project, kind of bringing, you know, how, what if we begin, begin to think about motivation in terms of learned rewards and, you know, learned values. And it does kind of completely change, you know, the way that you definitely like, you know, A, what you find and if you, if you go back to a lot of the current, you know, uh, work on motivation is that there's actually no motivation in the core theories that we have. There's, there's a set of couple of models that talk about motivation, but it's, they're so abstract that they, they essentially would fail to explain like the simplest action, right? And right. I think that then when you have that, kind of when you have a big gap between like a, a seemingly elegant model that doesn't help you kind of doesn't tell you, doesn't give you much explanatory leverage on why somebody would perform the simplest action, then that we identify that this is a, this is a problem. Right, right. And, you know, to build on that, you know, so like a lot of what we think of as motivation is often what Omar and I call motive talk, which is, you know, it's very much the, the Millsian tradition, whereas the vocabulary of motives is that we can't ever really know the springs of action. But what we can do is ask people after the fact. And we know that obviously what, why people do what they do and what they say they did aren't, aren't always aligned. In fact, they're sometimes not aligned. And very often people don't know why they did what they did. They just reflect on it and tell us whatever it is. And that doesn't mean that those aren't those self-reports and that sort of post hoc information isn't interesting and important. It's just it's not telling us the whole story. And then what it does is it leaves a lot of action, like Omar's talking about, like very mundane, boring stuff. Like, why do people do crossword puzzles? Why are there crossword addicts? And Omar's probably laughing because I always throw that example <laughs> into our papers. But like, why, you know, these sort of weird things, why do people like to take walks, you know, and just go for a walk by themselves? Or why do people develop like serious habits or like hardcore addictions? And a theory of action should be able to kind of cover a lot of that ground, as well as account for the fact that sociologists are now, and, and just social science is now where neurodivergence, right? That a lot of our theories of action are about neurotypical people and therefore mm-hmm. the theory can't cover and it can't explain all behavior so what if we go to motivation science where we are really digging into the brain and thinking about how the brain works and it can start to provide some explanatory mechanisms for why people do crosswords and why people hate them why people skydive and why some people are like super <clears throat> diverse you know and how these things develop over time and, and and I think that another thing that we discovered is that they're taking that approach takes a lot of things that essentially, you know, it's kind of like, you know, not analogous to, you know, physical science. A lot of physical science, you know, physics has constants, you know, and they are actually true constants, you know, presumably in this version of the universe. But sociologists have actual constants, but they are not actually constants, they're variables, you know, and, and the, probably the, the core thing that is actually a variable but that's what just usually treat as constant is the motivation to be sociable or to, so, for sociality, right? So yes, yeah, so humans are a social species, but there's an incredible range of variation in terms of how much sociality is actually rewarding and seen as a value across people. I think we're realizing that now, now we realize, you know, kind of now that, you know, everybody's triple vaxxed and everything is more or less safe, but there's a bunch of people that are like, I don't want to get out of my house. And it's like, you know, can you make it so that I don't ever have, but I, I don't, you know, and, and now it's sometimes people <laughs> go like, oh yeah, that's kind of weird, but that's actually not weird. There's a lot of people for whom social interaction is actually either neutral or aversive. So the idea that, you know, and it's built into a lot of our, th- you know, theories, including contemporary theories like, you know, interaction ritual, chain theory, et cetera, that everybody gets a hit out of sociality. It's completely false. And, and, and the, the effective neuroscience stuff kind of actually shows that. But it makes actually makes it more interesting because it creates like a number of empirical puzzles that the constant approach we just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, mm-hmm. to answer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, how many times have you read an article that just taken for granted states, humans are social creatures or humans are naturally social. I, I mean, even it marks as species being right as humans are creative and <laughs> social, like we, they all start with that assumption that, that this is a constant feature, that it's a fundamental motivation. And it's just not. And I think Omar's right in the sense that the pandemic has proven this <laughs> without a doubt. There's some people who do not want to go back to face to face interaction. You know, that it's it's okay to, to want to be, avoid that kind of, and it's not agoraphobia, it's just not everybody gets a hit off of the same sort of reward systems. I mean, I think the pandemic is a great, a great example. I was going to mention the, the classic Mills vocabulary of motives article, which, you know, when I read it a long time ago, probably 20 years ago now, I was like, 
this is genius, mm -hmm. but it doesn't answer the question. I mean, it fundamentally doesn't answer the question, mm -hmm. right, of motivation, right? It, it basically says, like, that is kind of inaccessible to right. us, if I'm remembering it correctly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's a methodological solution to a problem that maybe is not necessarily as much of a problem now as it was then, right, when people still saw the brain and the, the head as a, a black box of some sort. But it was a methodological solution that's not a great one. You know, it's good for asking people some things, and it's important to know that information. The quality of research depends to some degree on being able to ask people about what they did and why they did it. You know, I mean, my, when I study suicide, I ask a lot of people how they felt about, you know, so you have to ask those questions. But that doesn't get into the fundamental question of, like, why did the person choose to attempt in the first place, you know? And will they tell me that answer, and how much can I believe that answer? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes, you know, it happens. I mean, it happens in a lot of dis disciplines, but you sometimes see it that a methodological obstacle then becomes kind of sociologists make a virtue out of necessity and say like, well, I guess I can study that. Therefore, either it doesn't exist or I'm just going to redefine the concept in this weird way that has nothing to do with the original concept. Clearly happened with motivation. I think even at some point in cultural sociology, mean and kind of like, you know, personal meaning was like that. It's like, well, you know, you can't study, you know, meaning inside the head, so therefore all meaning is external, you know, which you're, it's fine, you know, you're redefining the concept, but it, but you're also essentially taking the entire swaths of a social life and saying like, well, you know, those are out of bounds, you know, and then, mm -hmm. of course, then what happens is that it's the basis of what's kind of, you know, seeds about this is that then other disciplines kind of essentially, you know, seep into the vacuum that sociologists essentially left mm -hmm. as they retreated from studying those phenomena. Yeah, and, and they do it exactly with all the problems that sociologists have critiqued them for having in the past. They, <laughs> they, they're, they're coming up with really some good answers or like important answers, but they're still neglecting the larger social environment and all of the dimensions of that that sociologists are obviously interested in. And that's, I mean, that's, we're not, in, again, we're not interested in like slaying sociology and reducing it to the brain. We're interested in figuring out how to use the brain and, and the science behind it in a way that improves our explanations, you know, improves the way we think about and talk about and ask the kinds of questions that we're really interested in asking. Well, maybe this is a, a, a good moment to turn to that, that question of interdisciplinarity and how the two of you have, you know, ventured into these fields, you know, taken some of the lessons from places like computer science and complex systems and physics and neuroscience, other places, and brought them into your sociological work. Seth, you've said twice now, you're not interested in slaying sociology. So is that a critique that you've, that you've heard? Or you know, what would you say about <laughs> interdisciplinary I mean, work and how it's enriched your, your, your scholarship? You know, I, I would say that you, you either get people staring at you blankly if, if they're not familiar at all, or they get very defensive that, you know, the, the threat of reductionism, which is sort of like the catch-all critique of bringing in cognitive science or affective neuroscience, is that you're going to reduce it, right? That you're going to like put it all into the brain and it's just going to be a skinnery, like we're in a skinnerian box and like we're just rats running around. And, you know, that this is such an old criticism and it was rooted in a time when those types of psychological sciences were, were dominant or like very prominent in both their field and in the public sphere. And, you know, that's, so you're trying to teach people that are your reviewers that of what you're doing, but there's a, and I don't know how Omar experiences, he's seen some of the things when I try and publish something and I get reviewed back, I either get, it's too neurosciencey or there's a, there's a reviewer who's actually really into neuroscience and like, it's not neurosciencey enough, but usually I get one of each. And then the editor's <laughs> stuck with like, well, what am I supposed to do with this? And then you're sitting, so you're sitting there and you're like, well, how do I revise this? You know, what journal should I be aiming for? And sometimes they'll say, well, this is good for a neuroscience journal. Why would you submit this to a sociology journal? And it's, you know, and it's, it's not every journal and it's not every, it's as mercurial as any paper being sent to a journal and everything depends on the reviewers and the reviewers' perspectives and how they interpret your paper. But it's hard for sure to try and change people's ideas to challenge like the sort of dominant taken for granted things like sociality or 
people you know, do things because they believe others expect them to do them, right? Without a shred of evidence that that's what we're all, why we do everything we do, you know? But that's the mechanism that we can cite because Berger said that, and Ridgway said that, and <laughs> Goffman and Decker, and you know what I mean? We have like a laundry list of people who said things like that. Yeah, I mean, I no think one? that, it, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I was going to say that I, it, it's definitely, a, a, it's a, it's tricky, right, to engage in this kind of interdisciplinary trafficking, right, in the sense that you have to both identify, I think, the ideas, you know, from other disciplines that you think are relevant or important, you know, and then also then engage in kind of essentially rhetorical, but in the process of convincing others that the ideas are important and relevant, right? Uh, so there's there's that both kind of the consumption side, but also the production of knowledge side on the on the, on the sociological side. It matters. Mm-hmm. I mean, I feel like the the they are, you know, they are, they are still. I mean, my sense is that is that sociology became somewhat kind of reticent to to engage in some disciplines, mostly because they kind of. There's definitely a generation that became imprinted with the idea that, especially the you know biological sciences, but sometimes maybe economics, they didn't have good motivations, right? While well, their motivations were were kind of imperialistic and reductionistic and get rid of sociology kind of thing. This you know, mm-hmm. Wilson, you know, E.O. Wilson and you know Gary Becker are probably the two kind of big ones there, right? Mm-hmm. It happens in the 70s and the 80s, and there was an entire generation. I mean, but that was, you know, really before, I mean, if you look at, at those kind of, you know, attempts, that was really before even the cognitive sciences came online, which can really, you know, cognitive science doesn't really emerge at, until the late, late 1970s, and especially before the cognitive the cognitive neuroscientific revolution. And if you look at those disciplines, those disciplines do not have any imperialistic kind of things. There actually are disciplines that, that are big tent, and they mm-hmm. are defined as a big tent, mm-hmm. and there's a lot of hyphen fields, hyphenated fields that are supposed to be inherently interdisciplinary. They're social neuroscience, you know, and I, and I think that that, that, that means that when those disciplines look at social sciences, they're, they're not interested in imperialistic reductionism, they're interested in collaboration. But sometimes, mm-hmm. a lot of the times, social scientists are kind of like, you know, shell-shocked from, you know, the old, you know, rational choice or, you know, sociobiological incursions feel like, oh, no, they want to kind of come and reduce. And I feel like that at this point, there's kind of a weird impasse because there's actually space for interdisciplinarity, but there's actually a relatively low uptake for, from the part of social scientists to that, to the source of open invitations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, one good example, you know, there's a, a as, as Omar noted, there's like a whole field of social neuroscience where, People are really interested in, neuroscientists are really interested in like relationships, like dyadic relationships and how the brain is wired for that, which is very like Durkheim and very like Randall Collins in very like Edward Ball, like very much the emotion stuff, right? And so they, they've got a pretty decent handle on like how relationships work. But what they don't think about at all is the fact that there are attributes of people that vary in these relationships there's there's dimensions like how intimate or you know impersonal the relationship is hierarchical differences between people and then there's the fact that people are not just in relationships with dyadic others they're also in relationships with groups and you know abstract collectives and things like that so there's a lot of places where neuroscience would probably stand to benefit from conversations with sociologists and sociologists could be harvesting these ideas. And there are definitely people like David Franks, Rengen Farad, like people like that that are doing that. You know, Steve Hitlin, who like kind of like sits on the edge of like the sociology morality and like some more like neuroscience, cognitive science of morality and, and Vasey as well. Right. But that's the, we're talking about, I mean, I could, those are the exceptions, right. To the, to the general rules. Well, Reagan Farrat has been on. I know that she's one of Joe Cohen's favorite guests. She always is curious about what Farrat is doing. But that is a great you know, example of, of contributions that sociologists can make and, and how we can enrich our own practice with insights from these other fields. Well, I wanted to turn to the, the banter segment. It's not all sociology all the time in the <laughs> lives of, of sociologists, although you know, so social annex does have a presence on Twitter, as folks know, and you all are both on, on Twitter as well. I wonder if we could talk about your thoughts about the uh, recent discussion on social Twitter about the role of theory development in the discipline's top journals. I totally forget and I apologize to whomever mm-hmm. brought up this topic, but someone was saying that, you know, 
in our top disciplinary journals, there is a overemphasis on theory development or new concept creation and less of a focus on either developing existing existing concepts or even as Max Besbrest and Seamus Khan had written in their article, Less Theory, More Description, 2017 in Sociological Theory, that we need more description. You know, we, we need less theoretical development in our in our top journals. How do you all feel about this? What do you think about that that discussion? Well, I think theory matters, and it's good that we encourage that in our top journals. I think that, that ultimately it does come... I think that at some of the discussions sometimes there's you can take it as like we don't want theory or we just want description or just pure empirical reports. I think that sometimes that's that's a version of that. But I think that sometimes when people when people kind of like are discomfited by the idea of journals asking for theory is that people just don't know exactly what the journals are asking for precisely mm-hmm. because the idea mm-hmm. of theory is now polyvalent and people are kind of confused even as to what it is, right? Sometimes people may think, oh, they want me to talk about Max Weber or something like that. And I feel like that's mm-hmm. that sometimes is part of the discussion. My sense is that if we kind of could settle on the idea of like conceptual development is super important. A lot of the science says we need to do this, conceptual engineering, thinking about concepts carefully. And if you are able to kind of you know, produce a contribution like that. I think that that's important and it's important to encourage it. I think that there's forms of theorizing and theory development that probably make like sense for an empirical paper. But I think like sometimes, you know, when you just use the word theory without qualification, people do sometimes get a little kind of like, what does, what does that mean? What do they want me to do? Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think what makes us different than other social sciences is our sort of theory heavy or our drive for theory. And I think that there is that ambiguity piece to it. And I think that you can even see the ambiguity when you read just the journal sociological theory or theory in society where the, you know, every issue is filled with sometimes it's theory in the formal sense of theory. Sometimes it's like theory and charting out new ground. Sometimes it's very empirically driven, qualitative sort of grounded theory. Uh, Sometimes it's epistemology and ontological conversations. And so there's, it, it's like there's not enough journals for theory, right? But there's also not a sense of what theory is. But at the same time, I'm not I'm not sure there's a need for less of it. I, I think that's what makes us so different from other fields and what makes us so much more useful, not in the you know pejorative sense, but in the sense that like if an organization wanted to hire us or a nonprofit wanted to hire us or a think tank wanted us, like we have theories. And yes, they're more complex, generally speaking, than like economics, but there are some really good parsimonious theories and we know a lot more than I think sociologists often believe they do because of the way we teach theory in classes, but we do have theories and they are good. And that's what makes our journal so interesting is there are conversations and the empirics are not just, I had a bunch of data and I did some stuff and look at it now, right? It was, there's a theoretical debate and I'm trying to weigh in on this. You know, maybe I'm not going to definitively solve it, but I am going to, enter into that debate and maybe get us further in knowing about X, Y, or Z. Yeah, I mean, but there, but there is a structural problem in the sense that there is de- there, there's demand for theory, but the supply of theory is problematic because, you know, especially the way that graduate education is even structured today, there's very little time to for the teaching of theory and for the development of the aptitudes and skills required to kind of, for you to theorize. Even though that's actually required, you know, Stefan, my colleagues Stefan Timmermans and Nilo Tabori have a sequel to their book on abductive analysis, and you know, and a huge one chapter of that, you know, a, a, a fundamental element of the entire logic of inquiry is that you're supposed to know a lot of theory. Like you wouldn't be able, you can do qualitative research without knowing like a ton of theory. So, but the issue, and, and that's great in the abstract. But the, the, there's like a little part missing. Where did where did you learn all this theory? Right. When <laughs> exactly? Right. Uh, exactly. You, can't, you can't do abductive theorizing without theory, but you need to learn theory. <laughs> and what cla- and what classes? So this goes back to the classes. Like if all you're doing is taking classical and contemporary, and your classical theory is like five theorists or seven theorists, and then your contemporary theory course is like Goffman, Bourdieu, Foucault, you know, a couple of like randoms here and there, and a couple of other favorites. Then like, what have you learned? Right? You basically learn some people. And there are definitely like reasons for that. Like knowing Bourdieu, for instance, is good because it can get you published in a lot of journals and that's a, he's a huge figure, but where are you learning your theories, right? Where are you learning like all of the theoretical things that for, to do what I think Timmermans and Tavor are talking about, how, how are you going to have that knowledge base 
to then go into your your field site and find your surprises. You might not even be looking for those surprises because you might not have learned expectation states theory, or you might know nothing about exchange theories, or you might know nothing about world systems theory and like, you know, how that affects immigration and blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's just a lot. And I know that that's then overwhelming, but if Omar's right, if we're going to push it into the journals, there's got to also be that sort of time. And there also has to, I mean, I think Omar wrote in his, uh, Kozer, was it your Kozer word that like the theorist is God, right? And that's true. Like the John Turners and the Randall Collins, those are, those are, that's a generation that's ne probably never going to happen again. That kind of armchair theorist is not going to appear. And I don't think we need that, you know, but right. there have to be people, there have to be, there has to be room for people to be doing theory and to be able to publish theory and, and not be attacked because you framed it incorrectly. Like that's not how theory evolved you know like it's not like empirical work okay your data was terrible your methods were wrong or like blah 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 the theory has to have space right it has to breathe and the reviewers can't just be like well i like this theory i don't like yours mm. you know and and that just doesn't exist because of the way the profession is right now and that's fine but that also then raises problems for people who are learning to publish and they're being told they need theory yeah. So, I mean, you're talking about the supply side, right? Well, cool. Well, y'all, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Annex, a sociology podcast. The Annex is a production of the Queen's Podcast Lab. For more information, visit queenspodcastlab.org. Thanks for listening.